Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship at St. Paul's United Methodist Church. My name is Marge Higgins. I serve as lay leader, and I'm happy to welcome everyone who's here in the sanctuary and also those who are joining us remotely. Welcome to those joining us in worship for the first time today and to those who have joined us many times before. Welcome whatever your sexual orientation, gender identity, age, nation, race, or station. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. Please remember that there are attendance pads in the pews and there are also prayer request cards there and prayer requests uh, are also available online for those of, us, for those of you joining us remotely. As we begin our time together, we offer sympathy to Valerie Ramsey and her family following the death of her father, to Beth Seabreeze and her family following the death of Beth's grandmother, and to the family of Betty Lou Long, who died in April this year. On a happy note, we offer prayers for anniversary blessings for Nathan and Rena Basawada, who will celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary on Tuesday and for David and Arceli Suli, who celebrated 50 years of marriage on Friday. Congratulations. So once again, those of you who have joined me in person have dealt with the changing status of our building and parking lot to arrive here in the sanctuary. Remember that weekly updates appear in the email newsletter and in your bulletins, which are available in hard copy here and online for those joining us that way. Also, please remember that the office is closed during this renovation process, and the best way to reach staff is through email. Our uh, St. Paul's Youth Group will meet tonight for a summer break kickoff party, so that sounds like fun. And be sure to check the bulletin, the weekly email news, and our website at www.stpaulsk.org for details on a number of things including the Poor People's March on Washington on June 18th, which is next Saturday, uh, I think. No, maybe two, two Saturdays. Um, Pride events on the 25th of June, a webinar on supporting local refugees on the evening of June 25th, the UMC Special Sunday for Peace and Justice on June 26th, which affords us an opportunity to make special offerings, your chance to sing with the June Choir, St. Paul's new online shop, and other activities to be in, in community. Also note that the opportunity to contribute to relief for Ukraine through UMCOR continues to be available on St. Paul's website. Today we'll celebrate and thank our Christian educators, wish our graduating high school seniors well, and present educational awards. And my friends, we have reached the day when we celebrate the four years that our associate pastor, Reverend Kate Mackworth Fulton, has shared with us as she prepares to move to her next appointment as pastor of Trinity UMC in Germantown. Please plan to join us in Fellowship Hall following worship this morning for a reception hosted by the Staff Parish Relations Committee. And now, please join me as we prepare our hearts for worship through the gift of music.
Please stand as you are able for the call to worship. If we wander from love's way out of fear or in pursuit of power, If we are turned away from the places we once called home. If we desire to create places of belonging that are just and restorative. If we go looking for what has been missing within us. Praise be to God who leads us on the paths of the street. Together, let us join in the opening prayer as planted in the bulletin. Holy One, we know we need each other. We know that we depend on one another to build communities that are whole and healthy. When there are rifts and wounds among us or around us, may we be people who show up to work of repair and restoration. For this sacred labor, strengthen our hearts and ground us in your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. As was lifted up in our announcements, before we have this opportunity for collective and corporate prayer, we were reminded of the greatness of God's love through the celebration of matrimony. As we celebrate the wedding anniversaries of both uh, Deacon David and Arceli Suli of 50 years, and Nathan and Rena Baswada for 25 years. 
Now they have no idea what I'm about to do, so forgive them when they pass out. <laughs> but I'm going to invite uh, David and Arcelli and Nathan and Rena to come forward. They are so scared. <laughs> come a little bit closer, come a little bit closer. Now face Pastor Kate and I. Beloved, we have gathered here today to witness the reaffirmation of wedding vows of these two beloved couples. This is God's gift to both them and to us, to witness what God has brought together that man cannot destroy or disrupt. And so, I'm gonna ask you, I, I won't remarry you because I can't do that. But I believe that God has ordained such this time that you might remember what first draw you together and reaffirm that vow that you made, amen? And you can forgive me or pinch me afterwards, it's okay. <laughs> so I ask, I she had, she's just as surprised as you are. So I'll go to each couple first, okay? And just out of, I'm just gonna do it. So it's no special order. So, David, face your bride. Will you continue to take our Sally to love and uphold her, support and encourage her? Yet you can get close to him, like you, <laughs> like you know him. Our Sally's back up. Yeah, show. like I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Will you continue to love and support her, encourage and affirm her, to be there for her when no one else can be there? And if you s do so, continue this promise, say, I will. I will never forget. <laughs> and our will you continue to hold David as your beloved? Will you continue to honor and support him, to uplift him and to care for him, to bathe him in God's compassion as only God would allow you to do? And if you will say so, say, I will. <laughs> okay, don't, don't keep holding those hands, and now it's your turn. Nathan, will you continue to hold Rena as your beloved, the, the, as the one that holds your heart, the one that get, first got that heartstring and told you she was the one? Will you continue to support her, care for her, comfort and keep her as only you have been doing and even more so? And if so, say, I will. <laughs> Amen. And Rena. Will you continue to hold Nathan as your beloved? Will you continue to uphold him, encourage him, support him, wrap your loving arms around him on the days when he needs a hug? Will you continue to be there for him when the world has turned him every which way but loose, to be with him, to stand next to him? If you say so, say, I will. And now, stick your hand out. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you joined these, your children together long and long ago, but God, you knew beforehand that they would stay married, that they would be a witness to your love working through so many difficulties. God, it has not always been easy, but God, you've always been faithful. So as you have kept them and have carried them, we ask God that you continue to keep and hold them. Let their next days be their best days. Let all that they've been through be nothing compared to all that you will bring to them. We ask this in the name of of Jesus and let the church say amen. amen amen can we celebrate the reaffirmation amen our Sally says she see me after church I come from a tradition where we're told that we always need to let people smell their flowers while they can. That there's enough places in life for us to be sad, and so every time we get an opportunity to celebrate, we need to do so, amen? amen. 
God has invited us into this sacred space that we might be able to come together as God's family, God's community of faith, to lift before the Most High our deepest concerns. And while we may not utter them out into the atmosphere, we know that God hears what we are holding deep within our hearts. So I invite you to join me as we pray. Holy and amazing God, we thank you for all that you have allowed us to experience, to witness, and to be a part of. God will be the first to tell you that it has not always been easy, that there's been some things that you've brought us through that hurt us. There's been some things that we've experienced, God, that have mystified us. There's been some things, God, we've gone through that we'd prefer not to go through again. But God, you have continued to be faithful, and for that, God, we say thank you. We thank you for being the God that has raised up us up off of our sick beds, who has carried us through our difficult journeys, who has been with us in the midnight hour when there seemed to be no way but down. We thank you for being the God that when we didn't have a friend, you were friend to us. When we had no provision, you were our provider. When the world was against us, you were our protector. We thank you for being that God. We thank you for being the God that in the midst of all the chaos of the world, no matter how deeply it swirls, no matter how often it comes upon us, that God, you have not forsaken us or left us. So we thank you for being that kind of God. Now, God, we pray that for every student who will be honored, for every teacher who will be celebrated, for every union that you will bless, we pray, God, for the families, the children, the grands, the greats, all those, God, that you have knit together, who you have bound by your love. May we never forget that until we draw our last breath, you're not finished with us. So God, we thank you for the healing, we thank you for the comfort, for the provision, the protection, the guidance, and the direction. We give you thanks. And as your redeemed, and as your precious people, we come together to pray the prayer you taught the disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. At just about this time of year, before COVID anyway, we would usually hold a teacher appreciation luncheon up in Fellowship Hall. We can't do that this year, but we can uh, show our appreciation now to those teachers and helpers who have kept, kept Sunday school, confirmation, and a variety of adult classes going throughout this past year. Many of you are here with us this morning, and as you hear your name, would you please come forward and stay? Pastor Pat, Pastor Kate, thank you for taking the time and energy to lead a variety of online adult studies throughout the year, especially when your pastoral plates were already full to the brim. We are also grateful to Mike McCurry for leading the popular Wired Word classes this fall. And of course, we give thanks to Micah Smart for leading our 2022 confirmation class through their months long study this spring, as well as to Jay Codner and Holly Smart, who assisted in both confirmation classes and youth group activities. We are very, very grateful for the many teachers and leaders and volunteers who kept Sunday school classes going strong throughout the year. Martha Francis Burak, Allison Clark, Carol Davies, Ann Dean, Alice Graham, Hannah Hildebrand, Betsy Katiti, Pat and Leslie Maloney, Wendy Manning, Kim Minerick, Dee Dee Murphy, Pat and Linda O'Reilly, Lynn Walker, 
and Sandy Wilson. I know some of some some of us um, are in, either in the nursery or not here this morning, um, but our we have our lovely, lovely Vanna's here giving out gifts to our wonderful teachers and helpers. Hopefully by now you have each received uh, a token of our appreciation delivered by one of the youngest among us. Thank you, Stall Cups, Willa and Lorraine. Can we give God praise for these faithful and faith-filled servants? We, the people of St. Paul's, are so grateful for your steadfast ministry during such a trying time. Thank you. you may be seated. I want to welcome the children forward for the children's moment. Wow. 
any associated stuffed friends. Hello, Coco. Hello, Quinn. <laughs> Come on over. Have a seat. Good job, Nathan. You made it. Plenty of time to spare. <laughs> All right. I want everybody to look at your shoes. Now, did your, raise your hand if your mom or dad picked out your shoes this morning. Nana did. Nana did? <laughs> We're grateful to Nana then. How many of you picked out your, how, you and Nana and mom. I appreciate collaborative decision making. Good job. Now, how many of you picked out your own shoes this morning? Tell me why you picked the shoes that you have on. Willa. Because you like them. Jack. Because my church shoes were too small. Because your church shoes were too small. <laughs> Say it again, Libby. You didn't have that much time, so you just pulled on your boots. I like it. Coco? Because your cute shoes got dirty. I understand that very well. All right. Now, you guys have seen my shoes before, right? Yeah. I wear them every Sunday, right? Yeah. Well, I want to show you a pair of shoes you've never seen before. I've seen those shoes. You have not seen these shoes, and here's how I know. <laughs> these shoes belong to Pastor Joey. Do you guys know who Pastor Joey is? Yeah. Yes, he's the new pastor. That's right. He's the new pastor who's going to come here in a few weeks. What's up, Nathan? Why is there a new pastor coming in a few weeks? Why do you have shoes that? Why do I have his shoes? That's an excellent question. That is an excellent question. Why do I have his shoes? Let me explain it. So, I want you to take a look at my shoes and Pastor Joey's shoes. Now, what would happen, do you think, if I tried to put Pastor Joey's shoes on and walk around? They would be too big. What would happen to me? I would trip and fall over. That's right. It wouldn't be fun. Could just slip off feet. They could just slip off my feet. That's probably what would happen. You would walk on a lace of I would trip. That's right. If I tried to kick a soccer ball, my shoe would fall off. Now, what do you think would happen if Pastor Joey, whose feet apparently seem to be a little bit bigger than mine, would wear my shoes? He would be walking around like a penguin, Jackson. <laughs> they wouldn't fit him at all. That's right. Do you think it would be painful for him? Yeah, yeah it would. Do you think he would be uncomfortable? Yeah. 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 I think that he will walk around. He would, he would have to put band-aids on his feet. He would have to put band-aids on his feet. That's right. He would get blisters. Did you get blisters once, Coco? Was it uncomfortable? You think you remember that? <laughs> well, hang on. Let's ask Willa what she wants to share. His feet would be in pain. Now, what happens if your mom or dad calls you by the wrong name? Has that ever happened to any of you before? Yeah, I thought, I, I thought that might be the case. <laughs> and some of you have called your other family members the wrong name, too. What happens? Let's pay attention. 
Oh, you're doing such a good job, Campbell. What happens when someone calls you by the wrong name? Does it feel good? It feels really good. It feels really good. Do you not like your name, Nathan? I, I, I sense a conversation coming with your parents after church, but we'll put that on hold for a moment. What's up, Jack? That sounds like something you want to take up with your parents. Mm -hmm. uh, Maloney's, uh, Jack would like to change his name to Quack. You feel free, to, feel free to address that when you're ready. So here's the point I'm trying to make. I have done a whole lot of stuff as, as the pastor of this church. And some of it has been teaching you and teaching your parents. And some of those things, a lot of those things, all of those things, I will stop doing when I leave. But... Pastor Joey's going to come, and Pastor Joey is going to do a lot of those same things, but in order to do them well, he's going to do them his own way, right? Just like if he put on my shoes, he would be pin pain. If he tried to pretend to be me and do everything the way I do it, he would also be in pain, right? When we want to be creative and we want to share ourselves with others, we want to share who we are, right? Not who other people think we ought to be, right? So what are some of the things you want to tell Pastor Joey on his very first day that would help him feel welcome? Hello? That you like unicorns? Willa? Willa? That you love him? No. No? You don't love him? Welcome. Okay, that's better. Jack? Hello? What's up? Those are all good starts. Because just like when we're making new friends, it takes time to, to get to know somebody, right? So we're going to pray right now for Pastor Joey and for his husband Matthew and for their daughter Amaya, who you're going to get to know. And we're going to pray that they feel welcome and safe here and that they get to do all of the things they need to do in the best way they know how. How's that sound? Let's pray. Holy God, we give thanks for our time together as friends. Come here, Campbell. Oh, hello. Hi there. You want to help me pray? Let's pray. Holy God, we give thanks for our time together as friends. We give thanks for all of the ways that we've learned to love one another. And we give thanks for all of the ways that we have learned to be the body of Christ together in a big God family. And we pray, God, for Pastor Joey and for Matthew and Amaya, that when they get here, they will get to learn how to love this community and that this community will learn to love them and that they'll get to do, just like Campbell wants to do, exactly what they get to do. <laughs> I know, baby. Hang on just a second, okay? I know, I know. And we're gonna pray that they learn that they are loved just as they are, just like every one of us is here. And we're going to say that in Jesus' name. And all of us together are going to say, Amen. Amen. Good job, guys. All right. Now, some of you are heading to Sunday school, and we have some Sunday school teachers who are ready to take you over there. So we're going to follow Mr. Maloney. All right. Hi. Mr. Maloney, the guy with the backpack. How did I get his shoes? I, uh, uh, he gave them to... I stole them. <laughs> For the record, I didn't steal them. He gave them to me yesterday at Pride. So the scripture reading this morning is to taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, 
for I have found my lost sheep. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of the Lord. So today, for my final Sunday with you, I want to do something less of a sermon and more of a fireside chat. I want to share with you two things I've learned during my time at St. Paul's and two of my hopes for you and this community of faith as you move forward into your next season of life. And somewhere in there, we'll talk about the scripture that Aaron read so beautifully for us. How's that sound? All right. Now, I want to be clear that St. Paul's has taught me far more than just two things, but I understand that some of you have things like lunch and dinner and, you know, life to do after here, so we'll stick to just two. The first thing I've learned from St. Paul's is the absolute and vital importance of authenticity. Let me give you an example. So on your front page of your bulletin there, you'll see pictures that were taken on my first Sunday at St. Paul's. Um, I remember that Sunday well. Aaron was our crucifer for the 1030 service, and one of my favorite pictures of my time here is of he and I serving my very first co-celebrated communion together. But I want you to look closely at the hairstyle I'm wearing. To the best of my recollection, I wore my hair like that every single day for the first six months of my tenure here. Not because I liked it, though I did. Not because it was comfortable, because it was not. It gave me the worst hairpin headache but because over and over I had been told in seminary and by my uh, elder women in ministry that my physical appearance should never detract from the spirit of worship. That things like dangly earrings and loose hair and too bright a shade of lipstick, all of that could get in the way of people experiencing the presence of God in me and through me. And so for the first six months I was here, I held all of me, not just my hair, very tightly bound so that I couldn't get in God's way. I wore my hair up. I forsook my trademark jeans and t-shirts for dresses and business casual. And I upgraded my flip-flops to a pair of leather slides, which I admit I actually do really love. I kept my sexual orientation firmly locked in the closet. And I allowed members of this congregation to say horrible things to me about myself and people like me in the name of meeting everyone where they were. And I quickly realized that what I was doing wasn't working. So I started to let my hair down. I wore jeans to the office once a week or so. I got braver with my earrings. I might have changed my hair once or twice. But most importantly, I began sharing more of myself with you. I put more of myself into my sermons and into my teaching. And the way that you responded made it clear that what you wanted from me wasn't heroic leadership that never showed weakness, but someone who was the same person in the pulpit, in the office, and in the grocery store. In other words, someone real. So many of you have commented in your letters and your cards to me over the past several weeks about how much you value the personal sharing I do from the pulpit and in my conversations with you. And I have to tell you that the biggest lesson I have learned here is that authenticity is key to being able to talk about hard things. And authenticity is the bedrock of what I'm about to ask for you, my first hope for you, which is this. Keep talking about the hard things. We have done that a lot as a congregation. I know some of you are heartily sick of it, and I hate to break it to you, but you're going to keep doing that as you move forward. But there's a particular hard and personal conversation I want to challenge each and every one of you to have with your loved ones. And it's a conversation about declining health and end of life. 
I'm gonna do a quick experiment. Raise your hand if you have a written living will and testament. Okay. Raise your hand if you've had a substantial discussion with someone about what should happen if you're no longer able to care for yourself. Okay. Raise your hand if someday you are going to die. Some of you have your hands down and I have questions for you. Some of the greatest pain I have witnessed in my time as your pastor has been the accompanying of individuals and families who were not prepared for the eventual breakdown of their bodies and minds or those of their loved ones. And while I'm working in groups of two today, I wanna to tell you two hard truths. Number one, a breakdown of body or mind happens to very nearly all of us. And the ones that it doesn't happen to, it doesn't happen to because they're dead. Number two, sheer stubbornness or a positive spirit cannot and will not compensate for number one, for you or for your loved ones. And so I beg of you, if you do one thing for me, let it be this. Do not let your children find out what your advanced directive says at the hospital from an ER doctor asking if they want to honor it or not. I have walked through this situation more than once in the past four years, and let me tell you, it is the most excruciating pain a family member can ever experience. Being put on the spot and asked, do we let your parent die, or do we keep them on a ventilator for an indeterminate amount of time while you make up your mind? Tell your people, whoever they might be, early and often what your wishes are. Appoint a medical power of attorney and have regular conversations with them about what you desire for continuity of care. Do you want to be cared for at home and do you have the funding to pay for 24-hour nurses? Do you want to be placed in a facility so that the burden of care does not fall on your family or friends? Who do you want to make decisions about your estate if your body remains with us but your mind has gone on? Do you want to receive pain medication, continue with life-saving treatment, or prioritize quality of life over quantity? Now, a lot of you are looking at me like right now going, I'm only in my 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Surely I have lots of time for this. To you, I want to say that none of us is guaranteed even a single day beyond this one. I have sat with multiple people over the last few years my own age, dying of fast-growing cancers. I have grieved with the families of overdose victims in their 20s. I have listened to the story of a college friend who lost her 50-year-old father on Christmas Day to a sudden heart attack, performing CPR herself in a vain attempt to keep him alive. Your days are not guaranteed. And so I beg you to have these hard conversations with your loved ones now. Tell your partner, your kids, your friends, your family, your next door neighbor, tell your pastors. Because in the last stretch, if nobody else knows, your families come to us and they say, I don't know what to do. Put your wishes in writing. You can always change them later if you want to. But I promise you that doing this hard work now will spare your loved ones so much agony and second guessing later on. This is the single greatest gift you can give to all those you will eventually leave behind. Don't waste that opportunity. My second lesson and my second hope are the same thing, and they are this. Go after the lost ones. Let me preface this with a little review of recent history. Our church today is a different place than it was when I arrived four years ago. I remember that very first day when Aaron was my crucifer, uh, watching visitors getting kicked out of a pew by the people who normally sat there. That would happen more than once. I remember hearing and holding a crying parent 
to whom an older adult had made such a rude comment about her child that her child has not been back to worship since. When I met with one small group a few months in and gently shared that I had not seen for myself the welcome to the community that the church tended to pride itself on, I was told by a leader in a rather skeptical tone that clearly I hadn't been here long enough to understand just what a welcoming and wonderful place St. Paul's was. <laughs> I did have a different realization about St. Paul's, and it is this that has driven my work, and that I hope will drive yours. The work of the church is to create a community of disciples, and then to recreate it over and over and over again. And here's the thing about recreating, it never looks like the original. How many of you have a treasured family recipe that you tried to make after someone passed and no matter how hard you worked or how many variations you made, you just could not get it to taste the same way? Now, many of you have been recipients of the famous Marge Higgins Christmas shortbread. I confess, it is one of the things that I miss most about my gluten-free life. And Marge shared a while back that the recipe is originally her mother's, and when her mother served it, she would make big kind of brownie-sized slices from a pan. But when Marge began making it herself, she added the little fork dots that we all know so well, and cutting, serving into small bite-sized squares. Her mother was horrified at the sacrilege that had been perpetrated on her sacred shortbread. But in making it her own, Marge also made it beloved to a new generation, to two new generations. And so too must each new generation of disciples make the scriptures and the church their own in order to pass on the faith that we love. Our church, as I said, looks very different than it did four years ago. I feel more comfortable now inviting friends and family into our shared space because I know the welcome they'll receive will, be go, will go beyond being handed a bulletin and a handshake at the door. But we still have work to do in order to be a community that truly understands what it means to leave the 99 and go after the one. And it is that work more than anything that I hope and pray will be the center of your life together in this new season. Now, the lost sheep or coin isn't always a person. Sometimes it's a lost story from our history that we'd rather minimize or bury until one of our local Congress people puts it out on his Facebook page and then it becomes a whole thing. I'm not bitter about that at all. I, I will totally still vote for Alcar. Mm -mm. <sighs> Sometimes it's a connection with a saint of the church, or a reclaimed space for creativity, or a new way of sharing power. But always, it leads to a fresh vision of a healthier future, one where people who had been on the margins of our life of faith are moved toward the center. Every church that I've worked at in my adult life, and that's since the age of 23, so about a dozen years now, I've heard questions like these. Is it worth it, really, to learn about how to support trans and non-binary people when only one out of a thousand identifies that way? Is it worth it, really, to consider matters of physical accessibility to the table if only one person is incapable of reaching it because of a disability? Is it worth it, really, to stop using language that associates darkness with lostness or immorality or other negative aspects of life if only one person in a congregation finds it racially offensive. Here's one you might have heard. Is it worth it, really, to list out individual marginalized communities in our statement of welcome if it makes people not in those communities feel uncomfortable? I'm not saying I'm right, but I am telling you that for me, every single one of those questions gets an answer of yes. 
And I believe with all my heart that that is the answer that Jesus gives us in these parables. But it's important to remember that as we engage in that work, that there is a difference between restored community and increased attendance. I'm going to say something heretical, but um, I mean, what are you guys going to do at this point? Fire me? <laughs> Butts in seats is not the goal. Butts in seats is not the goal of what we do. Disciples of Christ who live their lives differently because of what they have learned and seen and experienced here in this church and as part of this community of faith. That is the goal. That is the reason this beautiful sanctuary exists. That is the reason we put dollars in the plate and our time on the line. That is the reason we want to raise our children in the church. We want people to live differently, to know themselves more beloved because they have been here. And if we are doing anything less than I have been screwing up all this time. And so I want each of you to take a look around the room. Go ahead, take a look. And as you do, ask yourself this question. Who is missing? Who is the one to the 99 who are present? And what does that one who is missing say about us? What is missing from the image of God that is revealed to each of us only in the face of other people? I've quoted my friend Reverend M. Barclay several times, and I'll quote them one more time. M. says, each of us have only learned what we've learned because others invested in us. We will only learn what it is that we don't even yet realize we need to unlearn because others will help us to do so. Our faith requires us to offer this opportunity in return. If we can bring just one person along with us in undoing our racism or restoring our relationship with the earth or practicing economics differently, then there shall be joy in the presence of the angels of God. If we can offer welcome, community, and faith building to just one person who has been turned away because of their special needs, because of what they look like, or what's not in their bank account, or because of who they love, then we are indeed helping to build the new heaven, and the new earth. That is my hope and my prayer for you. Thanks be to God. Amen. <clears throat> Too often at this moment, as we engage our worship experience, we see this as uh, the plea to pay the bills. We hear it as the invitation to give so we can keep going. But let's be honest, it, the church, as much as the Holy Spirit moves, it, uh, BG and E does not recognize the move of the Holy Spirit. Y'all didn't have to say amen, it's all right. <laughs> While it's indeed true that it's the finances that keep us in a space that allows us to do that some of the ministry of what God does through us, it's not about what we give, and that indeed is heretical. Because you'll hear many of my colleagues say that if you can't give, they'll post how much you give, they'll badger you to give, they will bully you to give, but I'm not going to do that because giving has to come from the heart. It has to be how you feel for God, that this is an expression of your relationship with God. 
And it's not all about what you uh, allow to be auto-debited out of your account or what checks you write. It is about what you're willing to give for the kingdom. Everybody doesn't have a bank account that sustains tithing. Again, another heretical you know, idea that is coming for me. God never intended for us to suffer. Maybe our giving is that we show up when there's a need for a helping hand. Maybe our giving is we're the one that goes and visits the person who's not been visited. Maybe our giving shows up in a way that we connect a person with a job or a resource that they need. Our giving is not minimized to just what we give financially. So don't ever worry about your gift being enough. So as we come into this sacred moment, as the ushers prepare to come forward and to extend an, a visible opportunity for you to give, I want you to give what you can give, whatever that is, and to give it out of your love for God. Let us pray. Holy and amazing God, we thank you for every gift and giver. We thank you, God, more so for those who have come to this place like the woman with the might who are willing to give their all in the name of Jesus. So God, we know that you will honor the gifts and the givers in such a way that the gifts that are given will do more than is necessary to glorify and magnify your kingdom in such a way that everyone will have an opportunity to experience you. We thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen.
God, we give you thanks for all that has been given. We thank you even more, God, for the hearts and lives of those who have given. Now, God, we pray that we would continue to see how you use us in the upbuilding of your kingdom here on earth. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now comes the time in our service when we honor our graduating seniors. These young people have persevered through navigating a global pandemic. On top of this, they have been some of the strongest and loudest advocates for social change, showing the love of God through their actions. If you are a senior here with us today, please stand where you are so we can recognize you. We also want to recognize our educational award recipients. The educational award began many years ago when Jim Smith gave the church a check just to start it. It has grown and thrived and become something that no one could have imagined. This year's recipients especially are some of our most impressive students to date. I consider it a privilege to know each and every one of these students. As I call your name, please come forward to receive both a senior recognition gift and your educational award check as we celebrate all of your hard work. Some of our recipients were unable to attend this, this morning, so uh, we will honor them all the same. Ashley Boswata. Davis Galswijk. Anna Page Lancaster. Anna Page is already working up at a camp, so we're letting her mother receive this for her. <laughs> Melanie Morford. Aaron Mullins. and Ella Weikert. All right, let's give one more round of applause to all the Educational Award recipients. At this time, I'd like to call forward our SPRC Chairperson Rachel Stallcup and our Lay Leader Marge Higgins. Oh, and Pastor Kate. <laughs> Thank you so much for all that you've done. I have the pleasure uh, on behalf of the congregation to present you your love offering. We are so fortunate to have known you and had you bless our congregation and uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you. 
before March comes and invites us all to be a part. I firmly believe in uh, anointing. And so I want, I've been calling audibles all day. Y'all gonna be tired of me by next week. <laughs> but I firmly believe that we need to send Pastor Kate forth under the anointing of God. Is that it on? Holy and amazing God, we thank you for this, your servant. Now, God, as you send her forth, fill her to overflowing with all that she has poured out upon each and every one of us. Allow, God, her gifts to be magnified and multiplied in such a way that the kingdom is edified, that people cannot help but see you oozing out of her. God, for every place that she sets her feet, may freedom be loose. For every place that she touches, may there be shackles unchained. May those who are broken be reconciled. May those who are lost be guided. May those who are without comfort be loved. So God, send her forth with a fresh anointing that God, as long as she is under your care and your covering, all will be well. We thank you for the ministry and life of this, your daughter. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, and now comes the part for all of us as a congregation. Then I heard a voice in heaven saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then I said, here I am, send me. I thank you, family and friends of St. Paul's, for the love and support you have shown me while I ministered among you. I am grateful for the ways my leadership has been accepted. I ask forgiveness for the mistakes that I've made. And as I leave, I carry with me all that I have learned here. I release you from turning to me and depending on me. I encourage your continued ministry here and will pray for you, for Pastor Pat and Pastor Joey as they minister among you. We pray for the protection of Christ to clothe you and enfold you, to surround you and guard you this day and every day. We release you from your service here and will pray for those to whom you go. Let us pray. Eternal God, whose steadfast love is from everlasting to everlasting, we give you thanks for cherished moments and command one another into your care as we move in new directions. Keep us one in your love forever in your spirit. Amen. And now we can...
word before we depart, friends. Some of you have already shared that you'll be moving to Germantown soon and that you can't wait to visit me. I love each and every one of you. And I cannot wait to come see you visit in a few months when I've had time to get settled. But I want to remind you that your home is here. Your work and your family and your beloved ones are here. This is where God has called you, called you to the work of the priesthood of all believers, called you to the work of specific forms of volunteerism, even, I believe, called some of you toward the work of ordained ministry. And I cannot wait for the day when I get to stand and applaud as a member of St. Paul's takes that step and becomes a member of the clergy. But until that day, go forth knowing that wherever you go and whatever you do, you are beloved, that I will be cheering you on, and that whatever comes next will be even greater than what has been before. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.